This is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Tina Arndt AM, uh, welcome back to The Unshackled and welcome to Wilms Front for the first time. Well, nice to talk to you. Now, as soon as you were awarded your AM, which stands for Member of the Order of Australia, uh, which was awarded to you by the Order of Australia Council on Australia Day 2020, there was an immediate campaign to have your order revoked. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it was all orchestrated well before that because they had it <laughs> within hours of the announcement, they had it all ready, all this malicious material, old videos I made chopped up to make me look as stupid and nasty as I possibly could, um, all sorts of lies and misinformation about things I'd said along, you know, during my career. Um, I mean, of course, it was obvious the feminists would get annoyed <coughs> because my award was for um, my community service in promoting gender equity through advocacy for men. And I suppose it was pretty provocative. I thought it rather nicely summed up what I've been trying to do over the last few decades. Uh, but of course, this the, the feminists saw red. And I mean, I thought it was fascinating in a way that they um, so clearly were prepared to, to, to show their, you know, antagonism to me, um, to flex their muscles and show how much I was annoying them. <laughs> which is, was interesting in a sense um, because maybe they'd be better off just let it, letting the whole thing slide through. But they made this mighty effort to get the, the order revoked, which was never going to happen. You have to commit a criminal offence to have a Australian, you know, a, a Australian honour revoked, and I certainly hadn't done that. Um, but they wheeled out, you know, two attorney general, any number of prominent people to attack me, I mean, the honest committee people or the government house people who are running it all said ne- there's never been a case like this because they've also got thousands of people supporting me. <laughs> so it's a huge brouhaha. Um, but, you know, very annoying for me, particularly when they managed to persuade the Australian Senate to condemn me by missing, by essentially lying about something I'd said. And that was a, a, certainly one of the most depressing points in my life, uh, the fact that they'd got away with that. Um, but I came out ahead, I got my Australian Day honour, and here I am. I'm still here, <laughs> which is something. And now that the Senate motion condemning you, which is basically these motions are just a virtue signal to for the, the politicians to say that oh, we don't like this person or, or that, it was over a tweet that uh, you posted to your then Twitter account. You're no longer mm-hmm. on the social media. And uh, this is th- this was over a, a tweet over at the beginning of, of 2020. There was the uh, horrific murder-suicide uh, by uh, Rowan Baxter uh, of him, his wife and his, his children setting the car on fire and then, uh, s- then stabbing himself you've written about all of all of this on your on your website and uh debunking uh, what uh, what the what you're accused of of saying now you were quoting a police police officer who said we're looking at all possibilities including whether the man had been pushed too far and that just it made made the campaign against you explode mm-hmm. um i mean i felt we should support this police officer for saying we're keeping an open mind, which is pretty refreshing in a case involving a man who's done something dreadful. Of course, this man did something absolutely abhorrent in, you know, setting a car alight where his family were burned to death. It was just a hideous thing to have to deal with. But police investigations should always keep an open mind, as they do, of course, when a woman commits a horrific crime. They often say, well, we have to look at what led her, drove her to it, and so on. And in this case, the police was pushed out of the investigation, police officer who was in charge was pushed out of the investi- leading the investigation because of having made that statement about having an open mind. And I congratulated him. I mean, if I was doing it again, I'd reword the tweet 
you know, I mean, I, I probably should have put it more carefully than I did. Um, but I, the sentiment was absolutely right. Um, we would hope that men and women who commit crimes are treated with a proper investigation. And that's it, all he was saying he was going to do. Um, but, of, of course, when the Senate motion was uh, put forward by Keneally and Wong, who, of course, is a very prominent position now in the new government, um, they removed the fact that this, I was quoting someone else and claimed that that was my statement. And the Senate voted on that um, with two exceptions, um, you know, two, uh, um, Pauline Hanson and her colleague, uh, Malcolm Roberts, were the only ones brave enough to stand up for me. Um, and, I, you know, I was shocked to hear from many of the ministers in the coalition government who were told they were not allowed to vote against this motion because then the Labor would have wedged them as being soft on, you know, domestic violence. I mean, that's the way our system works. It's just appalling. Well, I know that one Liberal Senator, Sarah Henderson, uh, she wrote a whole media release saying you should lose your Order of Australia and uh, Tim Smith at the state level also uh, decided to uh, to uh, jump on and uh, uh, say that you should lose your award as well. So there were Liberal politicians who oh, were willing absolutely. to jump on the pylon. Yeah, I mean, incredible. I got these. I have a pile of letters. A lot of the, you know, the the ministers and people in in the coalition government wrote congratulating me often stale mail letters or you know emails and i had them sitting there and then so many of the people turned around and threw me out of the bus i mean it's just, just incredible um and i've confronted one or two of them who i've met since then and said how come you know you chose to believe the misinformation that was promoted about me when you'd only just written to congratulate me on my lifetime's work. Yeah. I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall during that. <laughs> yeah. You'd all run into me in those circumstances, believe me. But, I mean, what's particularly annoying is how the the Conservatives have, have deserted me. I mean, I hardly go near Sky News anymore, and I used to be on there every week or so. Um, it's extremely difficult. I don't get published in The Australian. I don't get published in a whole range of places I used to get published. Uh, Radio 2GB, all these, you know, <laughs> people who are always going, banging on about, you know, freedom of expression and so on. Uh, and they have chosen to also to cancel me. And that pisses me off intensely. <laughs> the... Initial before you made the the comments about uh, Ron Baxter, the the an, the centerpiece of their uh, camp initial campaign to have your award cancelled uh, was the interview that you did with uh, Nicholas uh, Bester, who uh, who was the the teacher who had that sexual relationship with Grace Tame uh, when uh, she was fifteen. She was a student. He was a teacher. He went to jail uh, for that and uh, so this this was shown that you this was put forward is that you 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 are so uh, uh, so extreme uh, that you're willing to platform a, a a sex offender and so how can you have this uh, prestigious award mm -hmm. um i mean that that was interesting because uh grace tame was very much part of the the group who were attacking me and it was all that whole the whole campaign against me was actually orchestrated by an end rape on campus activist who'd been trying to get me for years because i i know i think last time we would have spoken about the fact that i'd been out on campuses exposing our campus kangaroo courts the fact that we have a system on our campuses of crucifying young men who get accused of sexual assault a secretive committees who make decisions to throw these guys out of uni, um, destroy their education and often their careers on the basis of a really flimsy investigation, uh, which gives them doesn't protect any of their normal legal rights in that circumstance. Now that's been going on for years, and I'd been exposing it. And this uh, activist called Nina Fennell. Uh, was very angry about the fact that I was getting some traction in exposing what was going on here. And she was the one who orchestrated for this particular video 
to be made available to the press. She cut it up and, you know, she's got one minute or so of me laughing with this sex offender, um, uh, Nico Vesta. Um, now, I did that interview with him after a judge in Perth, not sorry, not in Perth, in Hobart, spoke out, okay, this man does a terrible thing. He has sex with his pupil, which is obviously totally inappropriate, and he is sent to jail. But he, let, he after um, finishing his term in prison, he goes to study at um, Hobart University. And he was targeted by the feminists as a sort of Me Too example, you know, don't let rapists um, study on our campus. We let prisoners of you know, prisoners study on campuses. We let past offenders of every sort, from including murderers, study on our campuses. And yet this man was being, you know, there was massive vigilante justice. Um, that every time he left the ho his home, the feminists were there protesting and so on. And I, this judge wrote an article saying, we, this is not how we conduct our justice system. People who serve their sentences have a right to start their lives again. And so I thought it'd be interesting to talk to him about all of this. And my interview very clearly pointed to the fact that he'd done something wrong. He deserved to go to prison. He acknowledged that it started as a very serious interview. Towards the end, we were we did joke about some other issues. And of course, that's what they've used. They've cut that up to make it look as if I was, you know, making light of the, the, this crime he'd committed, et cetera, et cetera. It was totally misrepresented, that interview. And, you know, I don't regret giving him a platform. I don't regret talking to people about who have served, you know, who've served their sentences about what happened to them and wasn't a reasonable um, thing to for them to have been punished in that way. I think that's a really important thing to discuss in our society and how he now feels about what happened to him. That's an absolutely reasonable thing. I think it's outrageous that the feminists are totally closing down proper debate about sex crimes, about proper discussions of what are reasonable sentences, about uh, when, um, what, what are the true rates of recidivism for things like pederasty. I mean, I, I remember a professor in Melbourne who'd done an enormous amount of research in this area, and he wasn't allowed to speak at conferences because the feminists just didn't want to know that there are some sex crimes where the victims report very little damage. I mean, if you're touched on the breast by your uncle and you're, it's not treated as a horrendous incident in your life, many people will go through that sort of experience and recover. It doesn't damage their whole lives. Um, and that's what the evidence shows. But you're not allowed to say that anymore. You're not allowed to look at the evidence on which crimes cause lasting harm and which don't. We have to pretend any sex crime has the same impact and is damaging for life. I mean, we're talking a lot of nonsense now about all sorts of areas, including um, crimes like pederasty. And I think it's appalling that academics aren't allowed to have free discussion about what their research actually shows. You wrote a a, a response uh, to why you did the interview and things taken out of context. And obviously what was used against you was what you said at the end. Over the years, I've spoken to many male teachers about sexually provocative behaviour from female students. That was because the initial video was was taken down and because it named Grace Tame, uh, but uh, the media still had the, the video. It actually didn't name, name Grace. It had a tiny, tiny little picture of a, of a Facebook page with, which had her photo in the cor corner. I mean, it was just minuscule. And the police rang me up and said, look, you better do something about it. It was never a big deal, but they just thought I'd better cover myself by removing that. It wasn't as if I was exposing Grace Tate, you know. Anyway, so it went on. Go on, uh, sorry. Tim. But, but yes, the, the end of what, the, the quotes that, are, that uh, they used against you. Yeah, well, I, I have had to spend my life having been contacted by teachers 
who are talking about the fact it is becoming far too dangerous to teach for a male to teach in a school and not where that well it's probably true of teaching in a school involving boys but i was saying where there are girl pupils there uh because it's so easy to him for him to face accusations a teacher wrote to me just a few weeks ago saying girls in his class say to him if you don't give me a good mark if you don't you know whatever if you don't cancel that detention i will dob you in and say you were coming on to me you know accusations are just rife in the school system now and you know that's the position we've got to know i know we have so few male teachers that's you know we've made that we've created that situation for ourselves now in 2021 the australia day council which is different from the order of australia council uh, awarded uh, grace tame uh, the australian of the year for being part of the let her speak campaign and when she was announced i couldn't help but feel that she, grace tame was made australian of the year as a rebuke to you or to to spite you that look this is our rebuke to uh bettina art platforming uh the 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 teacher yeah i don't know maybe i don't know <laughs> i don't know how these decisions are made i mean the fact that this you know there was a large committee of predominantly women who made the decision to give me my award you know means that not everybody is caught up in this sort of nasty politics and it may be that that's why they make the decision but it's also you know rape victims are the flavor of the month i mean it was, you know they're very clearly we've had endless prominent cases i mean part of the whole me too movement um to you know highlight this very real problem of course of sexual assault on women and grace tay was a very good example of someone who had clearly suffered as a result of that relationship and she should have been allowed to to speak there shouldn't have been this law saying that sh she prevented her from speaking about her experience you know that law was introduced by pre feminists in how this is tasmanian law introduced by feminists who wanted to protect the identity of sex victims that's how it came and then grace tag came along and said i want to be able to identify myself so women victims weren't allowed to speak out and they then decided to reverse that legislation um <laughs> so, which is a sort of ironic and of course yeah sure if they want to, they should be allowed to speak. That's fine. And they mounted this big campaign. But they also, along the way, you know, you, as soon as Grace Tame was allowed to speak, she started attacking me publicly. Yes. <laughs> and uh, also uh, by association, Amanda Stoker. And this was the theme of Me Too 2.0, especially when Brittany Higgins came out with her rape allegation, is that it was clearly a political agenda uh to whack the the morrison government and the the male ministers uh, obviously uh, the rochelle miller uh she escalated her allegations against alan tudge claiming she was abused in their affair and then of course there was the uh historical allegation by a deceased woman known as as kate against christian porter that yep. he sexually assaulted her at a debating championship in Sydney when they were uh, in their late teens. Yeah, I mean, this was not an accident that they suddenly had all these cases emerging. Uh, this is a deliberate campaign by um, feminists. Uh, in fact, there was a prominent feminist who early in that year, what was that year? 20, was 21. 21. Uh, said look we need some means of attacking the government who has got some ideas she said she said this on social media and lo and behold along come all these big cases um you know in the some of which date back as, as you said i mean gener you know decades ago this original allegation was made um it was all you know, an attempt to use Me Too type accusations to destroy prominent men and, and to try to damage the government. And that's what it was. We saw we saw this roll out throughout the year. 
And also uh, during that uh, time, I, part of what forced Craig Kelly out of the, the Liberal Party was his refusal to, to fire his senior staffer, Frank Zumbo, who was accused by many former female employees of being too overtly affectionate, uh, uh, wanting to kiss and hug them without consent. It's currently before the court, so we probably shouldn't say too much. Uh, but yeah, Craig Kelly basically forced out of the, the in Liberal Party in part because he wouldn't fire a, a staffer because he believed in a, he should be treated as innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, you know, there's, I wrote recently about the blurring of the boundaries when it came to sexual assault and sexual harassment and sort of scope creep that there's constant expansion of what behaviour we will include in when we're discussing these various, well, I was going to say crimes. Crimes are applied to sexual assault. Sexual harassment is not a crime. Um, it's normally dealt with under, you know, the Human Rights Commission. Um, but we've seen some, you know, very clear examples where people call something sexual assault, which isn't assault, and where people call something harassment, which shouldn't be harassment either. Um, you know, we had a recent case in Parliament um, with the, the well, I've got mental lapse now, prominent Indigenous... Uh, Lydia Thorpe, actually. Lydia Thorpe, yeah. David Van made, made this accusation that she'd been attacked by um, David Van, um, uh, another senator, and she claimed she'd been assaulted. Inappropriately well, touched was the term that she used, cornered in a stairwell. Yeah, but she said, I'm calling that sexual assault. And no one really challenged that. No one talked about that publicly as to whether that's in the media, as to whether that's appropriate. And um, it was interesting that Amanda, St I mean, obviously it would appear there is some history here. Amanda Stoker spoke, then spoke out and said he, he touched on the bottom at one stage. And she very rightly had dealt with it the way women should deal with these things. She'd said, that's not appropriate. I don't like it. Don't do it to me again. We're talking about behaviour which adult women should be quite capable of reacting to and telling men if they don't approve of it. And the point is that not all men, all women, object to having their bottoms patted. Um, lots of women actually used to quite like flirting, even a bit of touching, in you know, depending on who was doing it. Uh, in even in workplaces, it was part of the sort of banter and normally social interaction between men and women. And now we're defining all that activity as totally inappropriate, always predatory, never welcomed by the woman. And I think that's a great loss. And women write to me and say, I miss that. I enjoyed that part of my working life to have a bit of fun, you know, tell sexy jokes, whatever with the blokes I work with. And no one dares say boo anymore. And men are finding themselves in trouble for behaviour that certainly shouldn't be regarded as sexual harassment, for instance. Um, I heard recently from a teacher who had asked a fellow teacher, a female, out to an event that was coming up, a social event at the school, and she'd ultimately said no, and he said that was fine, and, he, you know, they moved on. But obviously she'd mentioned it to someone and suddenly found himself held hauled up before the HR people at the school who said that was sexual harassment. If you do it again, you'll, you know, you'll, there'll be disciplinary proceedings. And he had the guts, that teacher, to go over the HR department's head, to go to the principal, to go to the, I think he went to the board of the school and said, this is not harassment. There's nothing in the rules regarding harassment that include a single attempt to ask someone on a date. You can talk about repeated attempts and, and people pursuing beyond the point that the woman makes it clear she's not interested. That can be harassment, but not an attempt to ask someone on a date. And he was, the, the principal ended up apologising to him and the HR people were told off, which is exactly what should happen. But unfortunately, in workplaces across the country, um, men are being reprimanded for behaviour which shouldn't be falling into sexual harassment. Well, in response to uh, the Brittany Higgins allegation, the, the Morrison government, because they felt that they were 
up against a, 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 a accusations that they were a, mis a misogynist uh, government uh, who uh, dismissed women's concerns. They commissioned the independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces and also announced that they were implementing recommendations of the Respect at Work report. Both of these reports were done by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, and this was putting more requirements on employers to keep logs on sexual harassment allegations, no matter how frivolous. You look at that report, that was total rubbish. That, you know, that was circulated to all members of parliament, all people working in the parliament, and I think, I can't remember what the figures were, something like 75% or something didn't bother answering it. It was a tiny proportion of self-selected people who chose to answer that survey. And even then, they got remarkably little sexual harassment. And I think, if I remember correctly, there were significantly significant numbers of males reporting harassment, not just females. And 60% uh, of the bullying that was reported came from women. So it was not the picture that the, the, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner or the former Sex Discrimination Commissioner was hoping to get. But of course, that doesn't matter because the media always plays up what they want to hear. And that's always this idea of, you know, Parliament House, like everywhere else, is now a really dangerous place for women. And we, we have to do more to protect women who are always vulnerable and there are predators everywhere. So it goes on. I mean, just makes me tear my hair out, this rubbish that's going on. Well, you read these reports, and I've deep dived into a few of them, especially the ones about sexual harassment and, uh, and assault on campus, which is why these universities uh, develop these kangaroo courts. If you deep dive into it, things such as leering, staring, uh, even off campus are classified as a sexual harassment. Yep, that's right. They, they use the broadest possible definition that includes all sorts of behaviour that mo most normal men and women would not find as inappropriate, you know, unwanted staring. I mean, for heaven's sake, uh, if you're a uni student and you're walking around on a hot summer's day with very little clothes on in the, on the campus and you don't expect people to look at you, I mean, you you wonder why, why you're dressing in that way, you know. Uh, it, it's a very complex equation and the whole narrative has been so distorted by the way we're expected to think about these issues and what we're allowed to say. And, um, yeah, and behind the scenes, you know, people write to me every day talking about the truth about these issues and the fact that they're not allowed to discuss them in an open way in our society anymore. Uh, now, Me Too 2.0 achieved its primary object objective, which was defeating the Morrison government at the, the, the May 2022 federal election. But since then, we've seen the narrative unravel. Uh, first of all, with the mistrial, it was, it was termed, of uh, Bruce Learman, the, the man that uh, Brittany Higgins accused of raping her in, in Parliament House. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now we've got the uh, Walter Sofronoff inquiry into uh, how that uh, trial went and the investigation. And obviously during the trial, holes in Brittany Higgins' story and narrative appeared, including about the infamous cocktail dress, which she claimed she didn't wear, but there's photos of her wearing it afterwards. And we are seeing in the inquiry that the police didn't want to charge Bruce Learman uh, because there was lack of evidence. They didn't think Brittany Higgins was reliable, but Shane Grum Drumgold, uh, KC, uh, the ACT DPP, was, wanted to try it was determined to try it. And he had no interest in the fact that the police were, after months of investigation, said that her, her evidence was unreliable. Uh, it just didn't, there was not enough evidence to, to try um, Bruce Lehrman. And, you know, one, one senior policeman said he would resign if Bruce was charged. Um, fascinating during the inquiry, watching these police 
talk so openly about how they reached that conclusion and how frustrating it was to them, knowing that the, what they thought didn't matter anymore. We have seen, I'm just writing at the moment about the fact that the, over this period, over the last few years, well, the Higgins case rolled out and the criminal case occurred and so on, we have seen the ACT criminal justice system absolutely suffer a remake, a feminist takeover, where the whole traditional assumptions about presumption of innocence and the right to a fair trial are being undermined uh, by victim-centred justice, where the woman's right to have her truth acknowledged, to have her, you know, to, to, to believe her story is absolutely the most prominent factor in determining whether the case goes to trial and how that case will be ha handled at, during the trial. And it's absolutely shameful what's happening in the ACT. And I, I hope uh, that the ACT inquiry will reveal some of that and make some recommendations about it. We heard from Bruce Learman for the first time on Seven News Spotlight, where we also heard uh, the recordings, uh, the, the pre-project interview recordings between Brittany Higgins, her now fiancé, David Shiraz, uh, Lisa Wilkinson and her uh, producer, uh, basically how they were going to, to frame this, Lisa Wilkinson giving a bit of, of coaching. And uh, Seven News, uh, they previously did a, a really good interview with Craig McLaughlin, who was accused but acquitted, and how the ABC uh, reporters were also coaching the, 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 the women. It was revealing to a lot of people just how manipulative the whole process was in uh, putting the, the accusation out there. Yeah. I mean, the role of the media in all these cases you know, has, has been revealed to be absolutely shameful. Look at the fact that there was a, the National Press Council um, gave a standing ovation to Brittany Higgins when she appeared, you know, gave a speech there along with Grace Tate. I mean, here she was before the criminal case had even started and she's been treated as a, a, fe a feminist hero, you know, a rape victim, when we, we had no idea then whether she was a, a rape victim or not. She was, but she was absolutely lauded as such across the country. And I mean, I was writing from day one, this case broke, um, about what people were saying to me about what they thought was going on. From the very beginning, people wrote to me and said, her Higgins story didn't stack up. She, were, she announced that she'd been raped when Bruce Lehrman was, she'd seen Bruce Lehrman being fired and she knew she was going to be fired too for being found drunk and half naked asleep on the minister's couch. And so she blurted out that she'd been raped and then from then on her job was protected. I mean, what a joke. And then from then on her story unraveled. Um, and yet the media for the a whole year were part of the Brittany Higgins cheer squad and no one broke ranks, no one called out uh, the inconsistencies in this case. And it was just amazing to watch. And it's been true of a lot of these other cases too. They all jumped aboard. We've had a number of prominent cases involving media people, you know, uh, film stars and so on who've been accused of sexual assault. And most of those cases have gone down. The, the men have been uh, found not guilty. And yet the media all the way through was cheering for the alleged victim. And when, when, the man, when, when the case falls apart, there's hardly anything in the press usually about what that was like for the man and never any apologies for the way they reported it along the way. Anyway, I hope more media pe people get sued over the way they cover these cases. That's well. what we do. Uh, Linda Reynolds, she's suing uh, David uh, Shiraz and also Bruce Lehman is uh, suing uh, Network 10 and uh, the ABC. Mm. Oh, of course. And 10 has, in fact, always re already reached a settlement. And, 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 of course, it's a confidential settlement. But let's say Bruce was very happy about it. So. Oh, that was with News Corp, wasn't it? 
I'm oh, sorry, yes. I watched the news call. Ten, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm getting confused. Ten is still to be set determined. Hmm. Uh, but, 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 Samantha Maiden, who received a Walkley Award for her reporting of the Brittany Higgins story, uh, was the, her company was forced into a confidential settlement with Bruce Lehrman, which, and, you know, he reported to be very happy with the, the way it worked out. So uh, clearly that Walkley Award should be returned <laughs> taken away from um, Samantha Maiden. Well, Brittany Higgins, uh, uh, the 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 new uh, Albanese government wrote a check for her for uh, for reportedly three million for how she was treated, and Rochelle Miller, who accused Alan Tudge, she got six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So there's these. I'm not sure if it's just a to. Make the make, make the things go away, or to basically as a form of validation of these accusations. Oh, and a means of getting at the previous government, you know, claiming that they done something wrong. But I mean, the, the main component in that compensation was apparently her claim that she could never work again. And here, last week, she pops up in Geneva with a new job at the UN, Brittany Higgins. You know, presumably with her three million in cash, <laughs> um, helping buy the Gucci. Um, shoes she was shown in, you know, where she posed outside the UN building. I mean, this is the most scandalous payment to Brittany Higgins, and I'm very pleased that it's been uh, sent to the new Corru National Corruption Committee commissions. That, and I, the question is, is it possible to get that money out of that woman who's now been exposed as a totally unscrupulous, lying, conniving creature? I mean that. That audio tape played on the on the Channel Seven interview absolutely exposed her malicious delight in using her alleged rape accusation to destroy the government. Now, why should that woman get away with a huge payout? Just amazing. Well, I uh, I still think that's highly unlikely uh, that it will be uh, that that uh, the government will take that payment away, but uh, we'll see. Now, despite all of all, all of these uh, narratives and stories unraveling, we could talk about the the amount of uh, Me Too accusations that have that are that have unraveled. The trend in legislative reform all around. Australia is to have more laws uh, that make it easier for women uh, to, oh, to, to 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 punish men uh, that they've accused immediately. And the abuse of the apprehended violence order system, where the where the where women can uh, get the police to issue an order against a man almost immediately just on how they're feeling. Yeah, and a woman only has to make a claim that they're afraid that the man could be violent. It doesn't have to be any evidence of violence. It can be just a fear in her mind. And that is enough to get a husband removed from the home, uh, which will usually result in him being denied contact with his children for years when he wants to have access to his children and is finally given access to them it's usually supervised contact um that he has to pay for vast amounts of money to be allowed to see his children with a stranger recording everything he says nearby i mean there's an absolute draconian system in place which allows angry ex-wives to ensure that the punishment for their husbands continues for year after year after year. I, I mean, I haven't been involved in setting up an organisation called Mothers of Sons, where we've brought together mums of adult men who've been, usually of men who've been falsely accused or have, you know, had to deal with these false accusations in the family law system. We've got cases where you know, mentally ill women have gone again and again to the magistrate's course with, with accusations that then eventually get thrown out. But they can turn up two weeks later and make another one, and it all starts again. You know, people have fought their way, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, these families remortgaging their house to pay for court cases in the family court to try to get contact with their children or try to get custody of 
of children away from mothers who are really dangerous to children. I mean, this notion that it's only men who are dangerous to children is such rubbish. If you look at the data on who is abusing children, children are more at risk from mothers than they are from fathers. And no one, the data on that um, are key organizations keeping those keeping statistics on child abuse won't even release data on gender anymore because back in 1995 they released gender data uh, broken up by gender of parents or of gender of the abuser and they showed very clearly that women were more likely to abuse in every way except of course sexual abuse and they've never again dared release that data because it, the feminists made such a fuss when that happened um yeah so i mean it's hard to know where to start in addressing this problem of families across the country being destroyed by the fact that we have a system which believes only women and, and even women, when you know, yeah. put the like a woman might call the police because there's been a dispute or something the police can still even if the woman doesn't want to put an avo they can put one on her behalf because oh, obviously she's scared of the man so we'll do it for her yeah i was talking to a man today who whether whether you know they'd had a fight and she stupidly went to the police station and you know made this allegation the very first time in the court case you know this was heard in court she you know the partner went along saying i didn't want this to happen it was a mistake believe me and in this case you know the, the, we have a system where the the laws are set up so that the government takes over and the prosecution takes over uh the you know the the court case um i can't think of how to put that um you know that the men men are in are not in a position the even if the couple wants the whole thing withdrawn they can't the whole process continues i mean our system is in dire straits and, you know, lots of men listening to this, particularly young men, will think, oh, that, that can't be the case. This will never happen to me. Unfortunately, you know, in 10, 20 years' time, maybe when they're, you know, they're finding themselves and their mates starting to unfortunately deal with marriage breakup and so on, that's when they'll learn what the system is really like. I was once on a family law committee. I used to do a lot of work actually for the government. This is in the Howard era. Uh, on government committees trying to reform family law. And there was a really senior bureaucrat who came up to me and said, look, I, I should tell you that I always thought, you know, the men's group were making it all up about all these false allegations. And, you know, the, the notion that men weren't getting fair treatment in the courts was totally wrong. And then he told me about <coughs> coming home and discovering his wife had it decided to end their marriage. And... He, he wasn't even able to get in the house because the doors, the locks had been changed and he tried to get break in and he, he ended up being in prison. This was a really senior Cambridge bureaucrat. And he said, I would never have believed it. This is this stuff is going on and how powerless you could be in the face of the way our, our laws are now structured. Well, that's still not enough for the, the feminist lobby because now they're, they're they're pushing this coercive control laws, uh, which any form of, any, if the, the woman believes that she's being controlled, there's this talk of what is it, financial co coercion, which could be something that the man says, maybe you shouldn't spend money on that. We should save it for this or that. If you want to look at what coercive control is, look at the uh, Johnny Depp, Jessica Amber Heard case, where we all saw, the world saw that woman exerting control, coercive control over that man, follow, belittling him, following him from room to room, screaming at him, screaming abuse at him, um, throwing it, you know, all of that manipulative emotional abuse was readily apparent in that course case, which of course went against Amber Heard. Women, every men and women everywhere know that women and men can commit emotional abuse and could be very, very controlling in their relationships. And yet we have these new laws passed which are totally targeted men. 
New South Wales has actually passed its laws criminalising this behaviour, this coercive control, which is presented as some sort of mystical thing that only men do. And the funny thing is in New South Wales, the laws have been passed, but they're holding the, on, the city on them for a while and it won't be until 2024 that they're put into uh, operation because they've realised there's a bigger danger of women being misidentified as perpetrators. And so they're putting police women into uh, police stations across the state to ensure that they all indoctrinated, all the police are indoctrinated to only charge men. I mean, this coercive control is a total con job aimed at, you know, it's just the latest weapon for attacking men. And it's really frightening. And uh, also they're, they're, they've also passed in New South Wales uh, affirmative consent laws, which you can assume will only be used uh, against men, which is, is that there needs to be continuous consent. So, oh, a, a, and a, a, that a woman has to say yes. And if, I don't know, you mix it up in the bedroom. Yeah, they can the call, they sometimes call them enthusiastic consent. She has to give affirmative enthusiastic consent every inch of the way through making love. You know, can I kiss you on your neck? Can I nibble your ear? Yeah, can it's I all, all, all different. Long? And if she had and if, if the man hasn't checked throughout the process, he's at risk of not having been seen as having consent. And of course, then the problem comes is she, she can withdraw consent afterwards. Or she could decide that she'd actually had two glasses of wine and that meant she was not capable of giving consent. You know, if two people have been out drinking together, he is always responsible. Even And she could always turn around and claim uh, that she was incapable of giving consent. This is a total setup designed to teach women that they are always vulnerable and they're in a position to, to damage men and to teach men that they're always potential perpetrators and we're teaching that in schools and i find that terrifying well let's finish off on a positive note which was the queensland supreme court striking down a the university kangaroo courts which well not a positive note tim that happened unfortunately that was overturned on appeal i mean the the, the um kangaroo court situation is just dire um because it's all just keeps going on there was this case that that uh, a, a Supreme Court case which found that what the, the universities were doing was illegal, which is to me was absolutely the right decision. Um, what right do our universities have to set up their own court system, uh, which deny legal protections to accuse men? And yet the universities have just taken it upon themselves to do this. And um, at the moment, of course, the new Labor government is hopping on board the feminists cry for more, uh, more that the university to do more about, you know, making sure that no one gets away with these sorts of crimes and making sure more accused men end up thrown out of university and so on. I, I noticed that the Labor ministers this week have been out saying we have to do more about what's happening on our campuses. And you know who gets targeted mainly on our campuses? is men who are find a little bit difficulty fitting in. The nerdy bloke. Yeah, and who are uh, from a different culture. Around. Yeah, I mean the guy from a different culture, the guy who's not used to the way, you know, Australian social norms are carried out. Um, they're the ones who are really vulnerable. I have had I've been looking after a bunch of guys who are facing these sorts of accusations, and we've managed I've got lawyers protect trying to protect them, and it is amazing how many Asian guys, how many guys who are slightly outside the norm are being accused and they are screwed their whole lives can be destroyed by this sort of accusation well that wasn't a beautiful note tim no <laughs> i'll finish just by some personal <laughs> praise of you you are uh, across all of this your tenacity and uh, on these issues is is greatly ap appreciated on I'll, I'll say on behalf of most most men and uh at and many women tim you know every man luckily most men have women who love them in their lives they have mothers they have sisters they have friends 
who are really concerned about what's happening to men. And that's the very encouraging th thing for me, that I have such a huge amount of support from men and women across the country who are really alarmed at what we're doing to men in this culture. And, you know, I have a, I'm writing on Substack now and my blog is getting more. It's a free blog. You can go along there and, and sign up for that. And I'm getting more and more people doing that and more and more people, you know, helping me with my various campaigns. So if you're interested in getting on board, we have to. What I say to people all the time is we have to make our voices heard. The trouble is the politicians only ever hear from the other side. They hear from the feminists saying we need more laws, we need more protection for women, and they never hear from people who say this is going too far. And yet the majority of people think this is all going too far and we have to have the courage to speak out. Well, thank you for speaking with me uh, tonight. And, uh, yeah, you're always welcome on the Unshackled. Uh, we, we are firmly against cancel culture well you know i would have, would have hoped we'd all be against cancel culture but unfortunately it's running rampant at the moment but very nice to talk to you tim thanks for having me this is will's front brought to you by the unshackled.net